Okay, guys, welcome back to The Barren Grounds by David A. Robertson. We are on chapter 22. Okay, things are getting very exciting. They have the summer birds. They've got them, taken them out of that man's cabin. They're in the canoe and they're paddling across the lake. They think they are in the clear. However, the man has woken up and he knows that they've taken the summer birds, obviously, and he is now shooting arrows at them and has actually hit Ocek in the shoulder. Chapter 22, page 203. Get down, Morgan shouted, while the other two ducked as low as they could. Morgan eased Ocek onto his side. She lay down beside him. He had his paw on the wound and she had her hand over it, applying pressure trying to stem the flow of blood which was bubbling up around the shaft of the arrow. Eli started to sit up so that he could paddle the canoe to shore but Eric shouted at him from the stern. You'll do nothing of the sort little one. I've got this. I'm bigger than you, Eli said. Yes, well. Eric sat up, grabbed the paddle she dropped in the initial panic and started paddling. I have seniority. Eli relented and stayed down. Eric was trying to stay low while paddling the canoe toward the eastern shore, but she was still the most exposed of any of them. More than that, the bag holding the summer birds, birds burned bright and made them an easy target. Sitting ducks, as Eric had said earlier. Another arrow narrowly missed them, striking the side of the canoe with a heavy thud. The man was still at the shore, firing arrows towards them. The farther they went, however, the less accurate he was. At least paddle faster than I would have, Eli said. Everybody's a critic, Eric said. What can I do? Morgan asked Ocek, her hand caked with blood. Nothing, Ocek grunted. Not until we get to safety. Thwack! An arrow hit the stern seat, narrowly missing Eric an inch higher, and it would have hit Morgan's leg. Splish! Another disappeared into the lake behind them. They were out of range. When the arrow started hitting the water behind them consistently, shot after shot, Eli joined in on the paddling while Morgan sat up and rested Ocek's head on her lap. As the arrow came, as the canoe came to the shore, they heard the man call out from across the lake, you'll pay for this. Eric broke off the end of the arrow in Ocek's shoulder, leaving the rest of it in his body until they could properly treat it. She ripped his shirt in several pieces, then stuffed fabric against the wound at the front and the back and tied it down with a longer strip. Can you walk? She asked him. He nodded. I think so. And you know, if you find you're able to run, do that, she said. They retrieved their packs and off they went through the forest. Eric supporting Ocek, his arm around her shoulders and her arm and her arm around his waist. The bag of summer birds was now entrusted with Morgan. She ran with it cradled in her arms and found it hard to look at anything else the countless shafts of light bombarding her with warmth, beating rapidly from the bird's frantic movement and weightless like carrying air. How could something that kept an entire world alive be that way? She knew that birds were light, but it seemed a miracle to her. Can anybody see the man? Eric asked while the island was still in view. No, Eli was trailing behind the group, keeping watch. Can he swim? Morgan asked. I guess we'll find out, won't we? Eric said. Either way, we have a head start. After the forest came the mountain and their run slowed to a walk. Still, Ocek refused to stop. And though the journey was difficult, it was made easier by the summer birds. Their heat, even from inside the bag, was melting the remaining snow and ice as they went. Almost instantly, the green time was like a wave rolling to the shore, cascading across the landscape as fast as the four of them could go. They reached the summit deep into the night and the man was nowhere to be seen. They hurried across it, 
through the grove and found the hut still there, abandoned. Me Mahikan was nowhere to be found. The only trace of the great beast was his blood against the surface of the hut. Okay, so where is the wolf? Is this now another danger for them? And bandages the, that he'd torn off his wounds. With their worries about the man, this wasn't something any of them gave much thought to, except that Morgan did lift the bag above her head to light the grove and see if the wolf was hiding in the shadows or collapsed somewhere in the trees. Ochek was placed where the wolf had been. Eli started a fire like his life depended on it. Eric took the fabric away from Ochek's wound. Blood continued to stream from it. If it were at all possible for an animal to look pale, even though covered in fur, Ochek did. His mouth was dry, his black eyes sunken, almost gray. Eric pulled a log out of the fire and handed it to Morgan. What am I supposed to do with this? Morgan asked. Hold it over the wound, Eric said. When I pull out the arrow, push it against his skin. What? No! Equesis, please, he needs us. All right, fine. Eli, hold him down. Eli pushed down on both of Ochek's shoulders as hard as he could. On three, Eric said. One, two, three. Eric pulled the arrow out of Ochek's shoulder and immediately Morgan thrust the burning wood onto the wound and held it there. Ochek's back arched and he screamed. Morgan pulled the wood away and she and Eric inspected the area. Area, It had been cauterized. So she's actually taken the burning wood and to cauterize something means you've burnt it closed. So the wound where the arrow had pierced into Ochek has now been burnt closed. It's been cauterized. Morgan fell back against the side of the hut, threw the wood into the fire and covered her face, sobbing uncontrollably. Eric covered Ochek's wound with a strip of hide and kept her paw there. She tried to comfort the animal being. Eli did the same for Morgan. He knelt beside her, put his arms around her, and she just fell into the embrace. Seconds turned to minutes and time continued to pass until the shock of it all began to fade. Morgan and Eli let go of each other. Eric sat at Ochak's side, dabbing his hand, head and his wounds with a damp cloth. We did it, oh crotchety one, Eric said. Ochak strained to sit and talk. You'd be grumpy too if you'd been shot with an arrow. Oh, my dear creator, Eric said breathless. What is it? Eli asked. Something's not right, she said. What's wrong? What happened? Morgan asked. Ochek is still funny, Eric said. I thought I'd pulled out his funny along with the arrow. Morgan slapped Eric on the arm. You jerk, you scared us. Ochek put a paw on her hand and their eyes met. It'll be okay. I, but more tears came from Morgan's eyes than words from her mouth. I could get used to this kinder, gentler Ochek though, Eric said. I suppose when an entire village relies on you for food, there isn't much room for comedy is there? Good news, all that's about to change. We should rest until the morning and then head out to... A whipping sound came from outside the hut just before an arrow ripped through the hide and missed Eric by an inch before exiting out the back of the structure as fast as it had entered. He's found us, Eli shouted. They got onto their stomachs and lay flat against the ground. All of them, that is, except Ochek. He forced himself to his feet with the bag of summer birds grasped firmly in his paw and made for the flap. What are you doing? Eric asked. Ochek, no! Eli shouted. No time to bring the birds to Mizwa now, 
Ochek pushed the flap open. He left the hut and disappeared from view as another arrow narrowly missed him and all the others. Morgan got to her feet first, followed by the other two, and they ran out of the hut to find Ochek climbing the sequoia. What the heck does he think he's doing? Morgan ran to the tree, intending to pull Ochek down, but he was already out of reach. He's letting the birds go as high as he can, Eli said, so they can get to Mizawa and not get captured by the man again, Eric said. No, Ochek, no, you can't do this. Morgan grabbed onto a branch and began to pull herself up to chase after him. When another arrow came from the darkness within the grove and stuck into the tree right by her head, thump, she let go and tumbled to the ground. Ochek stopped for a moment and looked down at Morgan. Their eyes met. You saved my life, Morgan cried. Ochek looked at her for one second longer. And you saved mine, Morgan. He began to climb again, faster and higher, and soon was so far up, so close to the sky, that all you could see was the bag of summer birds and its generous light. Another arrow came and stuck into a branch right in front of Ochek's head. He didn't stop climbing, higher and higher still, higher until he was above everything, the land to the west where the cabin lay, where the green time had been for so many years, and to the land to the east where Mizawa was. Below him, the world was already changing. The snow was melting away. The trees were starting to bud. The cold air was pushed out by the warmth. Ochek started to open the bag. The birds began to shine brighter, burn hotter. He was straddling the tree at the very top of it. No, the man shouted. He raised his bow. Morgan didn't think. She got up from the ground and charged at the man. Stop! Don't do! Thwip! The arrow was released. Morgan slid to a stop and fell to her knees, following the arching projectile with her eyes. Far above, the orb of light at the tip of the sequoia burst open and a shock wave of light pulsed across the land just as the arrow connected with its target. Ochek plummeted towards a sky as seven ribbons of light streaked away from the tree to the east towards Mizwa. That's the end of this chapter. So Ochek was successful he did release the summer birds towards Mizwa, but the man was also successful and his bow, his arrow connected with Ochek. Let's see what happens next in the next video for chapter 23. All right, guys, take care.